Okay, that might have been a little bit hard to hear, so I'm going to repeat a little bit of what I said there. That's actually my voiceover. Uh, and basically, I start by saying, you know, we're doing a project on the future of entertainment. We think that entertainment has changed. And we're asking all of our entertainment professionals in our Transmedia SF community, we're over 5,000 now, is it an evolution or is it a revolution? And we want you to tell us what's happening in your world of entertainment. What's happening in your little corner that is changing, is going to be changing the way that all of us, you know, receive entertainment and produce entertainment and, and what we're going to be looking for in the future as well. So we're, we're really excited about this project and we're launching this, uh, this entire year-long series of what is the future of entertainment tonight uh, with a really amazing event. Uh, with entertainment CEOs predicting 2014 and beyond. Because, you know, it's, it's really easy to predict six months and one year and where things get really fuzzy is when we're looking three years out. And we don't really even try to predict beyond that, albeit I'm going to plant a flag and say, I see a holodeck in the future. <laughs> Not sure when, I know it's coming though. But before we get to the to uh, you know our entertainment experts and CEOs who are going to give you their predictions of what is the future, I want to take a second and thank some of our partners and our sponsors. And let me uh, bring up Brandon Grant from the Producers Guild of America. Okay, thank you. Brandon Grande, I am the chair of the Producers Guild of Northwest. Um, how many of you out here are familiar with the Producers Guild? How many of you out there are producers? All right, I see some hands up that are not members. So, uh, for those of you who, who are not aware of the Producers Guild, we are a nonprofit trade organization. We protect, promote, and um, look to the future of what producers are going to do. We represent both television, uh, new media, as well as uh, major films. And up here, specifically, we're focused on new media because that's what most of us do, not to discount uh, traditional film as well as television, of course. Uh, but I have a feeling many of you are more new media-centric or traditional producers who maybe are now delving into new media spaces as well as the transmedia events. Um, so why should you join? Of course, the camaraderie and networking opportunities. We have um, a ton of events like this. We have the Produced By Conference. For many of you who don't know, it's an incredible conference. And as a member, you get a free day. We also have free screeners. So while many of you are in the movie theaters fighting crowds for those nominated movies, we get DVDs and digital copies sent to our homes. Or we actually have um, screeners with Q&As with directors and producers after. So pretty unique organization. We also have plenty of resources for employers as well as employees. So. Um, I encourage you guys to consider joining, and it could be an executive producer, a line producer, co-producer, producer, it really runs the gamut, production coordinators as well. So please come see me if you're interested. You could also email me at brandon at producersguild.org, and uh, come see me tonight if you'd like to learn more. Thank you. The Producers Guild has been a great partner with us. We've done a number of great events with them, and we're looking to do some really fun things around the Game Developer Conference, too. So uh, look for us coming together there. I want to also thank the folks at Yeti Zen. Uh, you're in the Yeti Zen Game Innovation Loft. And you'll know it's a game loft because of the ping pong table and the pool table, and, uh, and really the lack of you know adult furniture. Um, this is where games get made. And so, you know, we really want to thank Jacob and Sana and all the team at Yeti Zen for uh, partnering with us with these events, and we're looking to do more with them in the future. I also want to bring up Koyan from Pengsi. Pengsi is one of our partners that has been doing some broadcasting with us of these events, and uh, Hoyan's going to say a few words about Pengsi. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Huyen, and uh, I'm representing Pengsi today. So basically what we do is we created a new way to record your live presentations. So how it work is uh, we have a mobile application which is available online for free. So uh, this mobile application allows me to uh, switch slides uh, from my phone and it's going to switch on the, on the screen as well. So uh, today our speaker is going to use this. Uh, while I'm switching my slides, uh, my phone is recording my voice over my slides and it's available uh, live to everyone who is online right now. Thank you very much. If you're interested, feel free to contact me. Thank you. So
So that actually means for all of us that are here. So for the folks that haven't been able to join us tonight, they can actually log into Pepsi and see these phenomenal CEOs and hear their advice. And for those of us that are here, if you have too much wine and you can't really remember tomorrow, you can look it up again. Uh, and, and so, you know, the other thing I want to let you know before we get into there's there's some demo tables. Uh, I'm sure you all saw VanFuse here tonight, and I'm going to have uh, the CEO of them come on up, uh, Par Winner. Uh, when we break the next time, you screenwriter, the uh, the Bayview Boom should be here. Uh, yay, John, you made it. Okay. And uh, so, you know, when, we're, when we break after this, there's going to be a little bit more time for food and drinks and, and go and see our demo tables. They've got some things that are really going to be moving the future of entertainment. And you can actually not only listen to these guys about what they have, but put it in your hands and try it for yourself. So one other thing I want to tell you about, I, I, a, a connected card company that we're working with is launching their Danish uh, game company. They've won the Nordic Game Prize and uh, GDC Europe, and they're launching right now Major League Wizards. Uh, they've got these uh, connected cards, a la Nuko Toys, and you can actually be, we're looking for our community to be a part of the beta launch uh, and to test this game out with us. It's World of Warcraft meets Nuko Toys. So check it out, mlwcards.com. They're launching this week. And one final sponsor I'd like to bring up is the CEO of Van Hughes, Steve Gomes. Well, thanks. Um, if anyone has had a chance to come over and play Van Hughes, if you haven't, come over and play it tonight. Uh, I think one of the reasons I'm here is we have a vision of merging digital game entertainment with real life experiences. And that's been the goal of Dan Q's Rock Legends. It's one of those things where you play music but you're using a real instrument, you're plugging in, the game interface is using real animated tablature, so you're using something that's used around the world as far as the gameplay goes. Music is so social that we want to reinforce that. So it's not a single player game, two player, three player, it's actually a four player game where you can compete as bands against other bands or against each other individually, which happens in bands too. Uh, the other parts of it that are really important socially that we wanted to maintain, we launched a social portal at the same time to reinforce the game so that people playing it can share what's going on with them in the game, push their content up, talk to other musicians, recruit fans. So what you're doing is you're paralleling everything in the game in the real world. The game actually records everything you're playing, so if you want to save it and share it, you can. We even went ahead and licensed the rights so that when you're playing songs in the game, they're all original artist recordings, but we have the rights to have those songs streamed on all social media. So you can push it on Facebook, YouTube, use our channel, it won't get any piracy flags. The goal was, again, putting something that's real together on a game interface. And the bottom line was, when you walk away from the game, you walk away with real-world skills. You actually are learning how to play an instrument. You've never played one before. Uh, the legends in the game, like Slash is your personal guitar instructor. It's, it's not an animated version of Slash. We did multi-camera HD shoots of all the artists. Slash, Bootsy Collins, Zach Wilde, Mike Ness. And they're all there showing you how to play it with an interactive interface that's rendered in front of you, showing you the notes and giving you instant feedback on what you're doing. Again, uh, I'm a parent. I got tired of my son sitting at the table saying, hey, Dad, you want to hear about my triple kill in COD? I wanted to say, hey, Dad, you want to hear about the song I'm working on? And that was a big, big driver for us. So our goal, again, was taking something where you could play it on a game console, and when you walk away from the console, you take something with you. That was our goal. Thanks. So uh, I just want to say about Bandfuse, it's actually really cool. I have it at home, and Slash is my music instructor. I'm learning how to play guitar. Uh, and, it's, and it's really cool. And, and it's actually one of the things that we really see coming in, in the future of entertainment. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of predictions that happen. You know, what's happening today, what's happening tomorrow. One of the reasons that we as Transmedia SF wanted to pull this event together was we see this world is changing. Uh, Maya and I and our colleagues who are the founders of Transmedia SF started this group because we really saw that the technologies were beginning to catch up with the ideologies we had back in the days of multimedia. 
You know, we dreamed of doing really fully engaging products on CD-ROM, and then somebody would click something and it would spin and spin and spin, and you would wait. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, I see hands. <laughs> um, but now, actually, it can be fully engaging, that people really are interested in, in, and available, and the technology is there for us, because a couple of things have happened. One, multi-screen is now mainstream. Uh, you know, those of us that are in, in uh, uh, the, this realm, you know, and usually have three plus uh, up to four devices that we use on a regular basis, including our smartphones, our tablets, computers, and our TVs. And this is just going to continue. Tomorrow, we're going to see new wearables, connected devices like our guitars coming, connected toys, and Charlie Albert's going to talk about that, and new perceptual inputs. We actually work with a fringe company called Outside Box that actually does perceptual computing for games and interactions. We're going to see more and more of that. And if you just look around at the number of wearables that are coming, it's profound. User-generated content is up. And this is just an amazing thing that's happened in like the last five years. New tools have been priming kids, especially teenagers, to become creators. Over 80% of teens create and share information on the internet. A Pew Trust uh, internet study suggested that 68% of all of the content viewed online by teens is something that was created by one of their friends. They're not waiting for professional producers. They're looking at each other's work. They're sharing it. They're making it. This is profound. Personalization in the future is going to become even more profound. And a huge number of Hollywood executives are realizing this. I think that my numbers say, oh, 57% of Hollywood executives <coughs> say that user-generated content is something that they're going to look to monetize in the coming years. And they have to, when 80% of their audience is going in one direction and looking at each other's things. So UGC is going to become a part of these story worlds, and we as professionals are going to have to write it in. How do we count the users, the viewers, the audience as a member of our team? Edutainment has come to fruition. We talked about edutainment back in the CD-ROM days. Uh, and now it's actually really here, right? We have MOOCs, Massive Online Courses, open courseware that makes it really easy for any of us to take any kind of course, anytime, anywhere. And we're seeing things like with, with Steve and Company's, you know, Rialta, where I, you know, I don't need to be with my music instructor or in music lessons to actually learn how to play guitar. I can do this at home, as I mentioned I am with, with uh, Slash. And this is going to increase. I think realification of gaming is going to increase in the next coming years. And we're going to see this being driven not only by educational pursuits, but by healthcare needs. And the quantified self movement, right? As we're all looking to get better, we're taking, keeping track of how many steps we're walking, how much we're running, and everything even that we may be eating. Uh, finally, a couple of other things that are really going to move us forward. You know, content viewing has dramatically changed. Live viewing has actually decreased. Uh, binging and fragmenting have increased. And this is actually going to lead to you know, a continuation of a fragmented story world. But it's going to be an always on story world. So as producers, we're no longer looking to create for a single screen in a two hour window when somebody's in the theater. We need to consider how we're going to engage with that audience because they may be watching our movie on their home fit on their home theater and pausing it to go or watching it in their own steps or binging on the entire season of episodes that we created for them. So how do we keep them engaged for a longer period of time? Finally, all of this suggests that old business models suffer, and we're seeing this already today. In last year's uh, fall sweeps, you know, which is the most important time for television broadcast, TV news uh, channels across the board were down by about 15%, with certain networks like Fox uh, having uh, losses of up to 23%. Uh, movie theaters are down, the traditional toy industry is down as more and more kids. This holiday season was another year of the tablet, and we're seeing these traditional businesses suffer. And what the business of the future is going to be about, it's content, engagement, creating meaning and connection. When we talk to folks that are in the toy space, we talk to them about having to be in the play space. You're no longer a movie maker, you're an entertainer. We all have to have a bigger vision as the world of content becomes more pervasive and prolific in the lives of our creators. 
And so, you know, to, to carry on this uh, kind of overview of what we have going in today's day and age, I couldn't be more pleased to have been able to pull together this group of CEOs that we have with us tonight. Uh, we've got a toy company <coughs> CEO that can give us the perspective from the world of toys and games. Now we've got a, a, a game company, casual game company CEO who's also got experience, he's been on the dark side, now, as a venture capitalist investing in entertainment properties. He can give us some in, insight into what's happening there. And, and a Hollywood you know, producer that's produced a number of winning, uh, both internet as well as other productions, who's got a new crowdsourced uh, video app. So what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna bring up, up Charles Albert, Charlie Albert, uh, and then we'll introduce the rest of our, our folks as they come, and, uh, and we're going to start the future of entertainment now. Thank you. Charlie. So Charlie, uh, while, while this is going on behind the scenes, pay no attention to the man behind the scenes, uh, Charlie Albert, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Charlie Albert is a, a musician and entertainer, entertainer, and a couple little known facts about Charlie. He's from uh, Venezuela, from Caracas, Venezuela. He actually uh, has his degree from Stanford in music and is a professional musician. And his company has produced more than 5,000 on the shelf toys and games, including Tickle Me Elmo. Thank you. Um, this is an honor. Um, I don't know if I really can think a few of entertainment or contribute to that, but I'll tell you a little bit about what I do know. Um, I thought I would focus my uh, talk on the convergence of physical and digital. It's not on the screen here, anyway. Um, uh, in the space I do know about, which is the toy space, as uh, Beth mentioned, I did play music. Uh, we're not really, uh, creativity is not really a toy company per se. We develop and we invent. So we provide development services to toy companies. Um, and we invent toys and try to license them. Um, we have about 25 people in our office in San Carlos and a few people in Hong Kong where we uh, have connection to the eight sources of manufacturers. Um, this is a wall in our office showing a few of the products we've worked on. Uh, I've mentioned it's about 5,000. Here's some more. Uh, Funfair, I mentioned, is the division that does the inventing. Here's a screen showing some of our invented projects. We usually work with partners when we do the inventing, um, so I just want to give credit where it's due. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the topic convergence of physical and digital and entertainment. Mm -hmm in the space I do understand, which is toys and games for very young kids. And I'm going to give a couple quick examples of, of products that had a huge impact, um, and, uh, and then my thoughts about where we're headed. So I'm old enough, <laughs> it's funny when you talked about band views, I, learned, I played, learned to play guitar by slowing my 33 RPM record to 16. <laughs> That's how I copied the guitar licks. So, um, <coughs> Uh, anyway, we didn't have all the tools we have, we have now. Um, so I've been through records, magnetic tape, digital, the, the sort of end of the record industry as we knew it when I was part of it. And, uh, and as a musician, I ended up composing for video games and then toys, which really was a space that uh, sort of became my home. So we've been in business about 15 years. and. So I remember this. I actually played Pong, I think, at Andy Capp's saloon when it was there, the first one. Uh, and my band played there. <laughs> then along came uh, Genesis and Nintendo and uh, portable games, platform games evolved. This is the first example of what I want to talk about briefly. Um, if everybody remembers, it was in the platform game space. Typical gamers and people in the game industry were very skeptical of Wii. Uh, everybody thought we needed more processing power, more memory, more RAM, faster processors. And Nintendo took a turn and they focused on this controller and the interaction that the people could have in the game, uh, emulating things like soccer, uh, not soccer, baseball, and golf, and tennis. Um, and they had huge success. 
uh, with the we and the we fit that sort of ran against the conventional wisdom of the time. Another example, I, which I ironically didn't know who was going to be here today, is Guitar Hero, uh, which was one of the biggest businesses ever. And Guitar Hero was essentially a toy connected to a video game platform. So somebody took a very, in my industry, traditional play pattern, which is what we call role play, um, playing with a toy guitar, but using a video game mechanic. And that combination made a huge impact on, in both video games and toys. And another example before that, I skipped one, is uh, Dance Dance Revolution. Dancing is obviously a universal physical activity across the everybody, culture, age, uh, and so forth. Um, and combined with video game mechanics, we cre they created the, this huge, it was created. So that's history. Uh, I'm going to mention briefly the touch. Uh, the Apple thought about touch in a new way, and although obviously touch was not a new thing, the touch screen was not a new thing, they created a huge revolution in the way people play just by thinking about and re-engineering the way people interact with their devices by a touch. It's moving very fast here because of a lot. Uh, Beth mentioned that I would talk about app-enabled toys or app-connected toys. That's a space we are working in. I think the jury is out on uh, how successful app-connected toys will be. Uh, but there's a very related phenomenon that I'll get to in a minute that was a huge success. So people have done <coughs> Cars that the, sense, uh, the screen senses how you play, they've done action figures. Uh, this one is a big success. Um, and uh, I know that the app has been downloaded at least seven or eight million times, something to that effect. Um, this is Furby. And this is a good example of a fairly successful application of an app connected to a toy. In this case, they actually use a uh, audio. Uh, Watermark, as it's called, uh, communicate between the app and the toy with a very low cost and crude way of connecting. Uh, but it's worked very, very well and been successful uh, for those guys. People are using apps as remote controls for helicopters. Here's several examples of classic toy figure, uh, configurations and play patterns. Uh, being attempted with iPhone as the interface, T sensor, location sensor, and so forth built in. Uh, a gun, guitar, uh, emulation of a handheld game, steering wheel using the G sensor. So then we come to Skylanders, which was, I think they passed a billion dollars in business. Um, they again sort of were breaking the conventional wisdom. Uh, people in games didn't think. Gamers are interested in toys, and people in toys have actually tried to do things like this unsuccessfully um, and decided it wasn't a good idea. But with the right execution and the right property to base it on, they succeeded in making what could arguably be the biggest toy of the year in the first year that it uh, came out, the second year, I can't remember which. And the biggest game, or close to the biggest game of the year, Call of Duty, I think, is the other one. Um, and basically, it's a toy, a collectible action figure that sits on the base unit and allows you to take your toy into your game, and vice versa, it allows you to take some of the game stacks and take them into your toy. So they kind of are really turning things upside down with that, and of course, Disney paid attention, although I think they claim they came up with it independently. We're already working on this. Um, but they have come up with infinity which just came out this year, um, and has been pretty successful by what I've been uh, reading. And I keep looking at Beth, she nods her head. <laughs> she, she knows everything, so that, that makes me feel better. Um, so I don't put my foot in my mouth. Anyway, uh, interesting thing about Infinity is that they are, for really the first time, as far as I know, and I've read this, brought, given people the ability to take characters and brands that existed in separate universes, like Toy Story and Monsters, Inc., for example, together in one place. You can actually play with Woody, or you will be able to, I'm not sure who, who they issued with, Woody and Sully from Monsters, Inc. together um, in the same space or same gaming space. 
um, which is an interesting thing that a lot of people wanted to do. Apparently, John lasted a really foolish thing. Because he first did that in entertainment and Toy Story. Um, I want to back up and I skipped one thing. Uh, I just want to mention the Guitar Hero Dance Dance Revolution. I think of two examples, and so is this, of where entertainment, physical play, toys, object play, whatever you want to call it, and video gaming mechanics all come together to make a very powerful product. Um, I think part of the Guitar Hero's success is based on the bands and the content and the brands that people were identified with. Part of it was based on good execution of the video game type of and, uh, and finally on the element of buying that toy and being able to play with it or having that map. And, um, so that's <coughs> something I think people should continue to keep an eye on. Um, in reverse, you can take a toy and enhance it with video game or digital type uh, behaviors. These are essentially pets that you can own and robots, um, which sort of start with a classic nurturing uh, drive or play pattern in the toy business, but they have Tamagotchi-like play and Zoomer there on the left. You can actually interact with Zoomer and play games. The eyes are displaying. It's infrared sensors that allow you to like to play certain games with Zoomer. So that's an interesting application, and that was a very successful project. You've got people making smart blocks, uh, sifty or locally, so they just took blocks and gave them made them smart, gave them touch and uh, graphic display. You can even make a ball into a smart ball. Uh, Spiro has come out with this product, which is kind of cool. It's a robot ball controlled through your iPhone. I'm going to have time, but I think everybody should be paying really close attention to 3D printing. Um, uh, everybody's talking about it. Mattel has a toy out that does crack at least will paint uh, 3D on your uh, or augmented reality uh, part of a, a compelling play pattern. Um, I'm going to wrap this up really quick. So I have three areas that I think should be focused on when thinking about this subject that I briefly touched on. There's a huge array of play pack platforms, and as Beth mentioned, the barriers and the silos are all disappearing. The kids don't care and don't really see the difference between entertainment and toys and games and apps and so forth. Um, so, but each of them have their history and their ecology and their approach to play, which can inform the other. So I think it's worth looking at historical play patterns and platforms in order to see where the next breakthrough might come. Uh, in the play industry, we all study and have, a, have lists of what we call play patterns, nurturing, active play, role play, creative play, arts and crafts, object play. Obviously, there's all kinds of sports play patterns. And those are worth thinking about and looking at from diff different perspectives. And finally, especially because of iPhone and PSP and things like that, I think, uh, and the general connectedness of everything, I think it's worth paying attention to play venues and think about them. Uh, not only in indoors in the living room or den where the classic video game and TV are, but in the car, in the restaurant, in subways. I noticed when I traveled to Asia that I counted that 50% of the people in the subways are playing on um, something like this, usually a giant Samsung. Um, and uh, we put on this Congress that Beth spoke at and blew me away um, called the World Congress of Play, in which we talked about these different play patterns. And McDonald's showed up, showed up without us really expecting it. And that's sort of an illustration of their onto the fact that play is so important for their business, with their play places where we used to stop when we were traveling. So, anyway, theme parks, and you mentioned theaters, um, and I think they're going to be changing over time. So, that is my time. I think that's it. I think we're going to have questions later or now. No, we'll have some questions later. Okay. But does anybody have a burning question for Charlie now? Thank you, Charlie. That was great. Yeah. So, with regards to the future and leapfrogging with the technology, what do you understand about sets of technology, ultra wideband, and 
and having the sensation of the experience of all the interaction that goes on with a game or a toy. Because if we look at the technology that's advancing, we have to be able to move in space and time quickly because we can't evolve our historical experiences but how we leapfrog to the future because we don't know how that's going to play. So what do you really understand about ultra-blind embedded technology and integrating that within the game and having sensations? Because if you look at the movie Her, he didn't necessarily have to interact with the surrogate. He could have actually went through a virtual experience. Well, I'm going to preface that. You, you phrased the question, what do I understand? And the answer is, I don't consider myself an expert on that space that you're describing. Um, in the space that I work in, which is a toy space and, and games for really young kids, we're very focused on low cost. So that kind of cutting edge, high bandwidth stuff, I think Beth is, is much more qualified to talk about. Um, and I think it's a really interesting topic. You know, it's a, it's a great question, and, and thank you, Charlie, you know, that is a great answer. So, you, you know, we're going we're gonna to touch on it. You know, I think that to Charlie's point, though, I, it's, it's an excellent point. Because one of the things that we all look at is when, when technologies advance to the, to the point where they become mainstream, is when we can really have them cross the chasm from, you know, specialized products where, you know, one or two guys at Google actually have robots that they can interact with. Can the rest of us afford them and interact with them? No, not yet. So one of the things when we're looking at connected toys, we look at you know uh, touch devices and Bluetooth LE because it's dropping in price and RFID. So price is always a feature because the th when price drops it, it, and things get out to a wider audience, it brings in more and more artists that be can begin to really you know in the in the terms of filmmaking create the jump cut. Right, you know, uh, technology for technology's sake is not storytelling, and we're not quite there yet with those technologies. So that's kind of in my vision of the Hollywood. But thank you, Charlie. You have a great point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker, and I don't know that he's going to want to touch this one about. Uh, uh, oh, there you go. Marco has promised to talk about that. Uh, Marco Morez, and I hope that I'm not butchering everybody's name here tonight. No. Uh, <laughs> I also don't think the transport, you know, the band matters, but all well, the user experience is what we're focused on. But uh, you have to, I mean, the, as you know, for those of you, haptic sensors are like force field system, and you fly a simulator that you get the sort of feedback, and you feel like you're flying the, the helicopter or the, the battleship and whatever you have. So, uh, well, thanks for coming over here, and, and really, hopefully, I'll tease you with some future ideas and. Uh, when Beth talked about 2014, I thought, well, there's not really much coming out in 2014 to make a dramatic impact, but maybe I'll go a little bit further ahead and, and then really sort of, at least from our perspective, how we're looking at the market and what, what, what we think is going to come up. So let me sort of do shameless promotion of uh, Playverse. Um, started in 2004, I joined the company two years and two months ago, and then you know, started as an online publisher of casual games and and my focus has been really with the team to become a leading mobile game developer. We, we thought, you know, we're a small company, we're actually a block from here on 2nd and Folsom, and uh, we focused on just becoming one of the best mobile game developers. And, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We have an awesome team. Uh, the sort of the game uh, historian is Tom Hall, is our creative director and co-head of our studio really incredible talent of PMs and engineers, producers. I'll make sure our producers are signing up for PGA. So, and, uh, but we have a great team. You know, you got to have a great team to do, to do anything, on the, any, anything in general. But, uh, so we're focused on really building our brand presence to make sure that, you know, uh, when you look at an app store, somebody said a couple months ago that any day uh, there are about 5,000 games released on app stores. That's an incredible number. If, even if it was off by, you know, some uh, percentage, it's still an incredible amount of uh, number of number of games coming out to app stores every day. And you can tell that's just, you know, there's just so many games and, and incredibly talented people. The, t the top part is getting the visibility and being discovered, right? So we're really focused on building our scale and focus on our brand name and build our own proprietary publishing and promotion network. We call P3M stands for Play Post Promotion Publishing Network. 
and, and then we grew the scale from 3 million monthly actives to now close to 14, 15 million monthly actives. And it really gives us enormous UA leverage so that we can, uh, we don't show any third party content. If you play our games, our intent is to really delight you with the great game experience and we don't really show in the middle of the game a Lexus commercial or something else. And I saw a diaper ad in one month game. Yeah. That was relevant. Uh, so we want to make sure that you have a great experience and we preserve and protect the user experience and quality of the game uh, experience that you have. And, uh, and as you know, we started the Dash franchise. We love to tell character-based stories. You know, it really creates a long-term engagement with the audience. At the end of the day, they will really determine your success. As you know, uh, it, given that everything is freemium, about 95 to 97 percent of the audience do not pay a dime, and they play, they don't pay, and you really try to convert from one to four percent, one to five percent range, and make money from that. So, real buyer base pretty high, and this is also a shameless chess pounding slide. Our names were fortunate to be, you know, ranked up top from one to twenty. Uh, both our original IP, which is Flow Stories, as well as branded IP we did with uh, Sony and Nickelodeon. And those games have been very well received, typically four, four and a half star games. So let me talk about uh, where we are right now. By the way, who hasn't played any of these games? One, two, three. Okay, about 1.3%. Uh, um, so the current app score is really dominated by, as you know, if you look at the top grossing apps, about either 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 are games, right? Game is a great entertainer. If the economy is going south, you play to play vicarious so to escape the reality. If you're doing really great, you play to enhance it even further. Oops. Somebody got offended? There we go. So as you know, Candy Crush and Clash of Clans, A Days, Subway Surfers, and, and you know, Jetpack Joyride. We have we currently manage 68 SKUs on Amazon and Google Play and Apple. And and, and, and oops. Oh. Well, that was a discontinuity. And <laughs> so and, and Romeo was a pioneer. Uh, we have a good health insurance, by the way. <laughs> In terms of user-generated content, Minecraft, right? I mean, Brett was talking about you know, user-generated content. You know, uh, we actually just spun out our own uh, server. Just what you can build with that is enormously interesting and appealing, and you can just play forever. So, but this is the really current state of casual gaming right now. Great, you know, games, and obviously the top, you know, ten are making enormous amount of money. And the bar is raised very, very high. I mean, you have to be, you not only have to have great game content, you also have to have a very incredible sort of uh, and fine tuned live ops because mobile gaming is all about live ops 24 7. So let's talk about what, the, what we think the future is. I mean, and the question is, you know, where are we going, right? And uh, there's, there, this is actually a, probably a month long seminar that we can arrange and talk about it. So I'm going to really give you my sort of short, small slice of where we think we're heading, because uh, you know, given a 10 minute uh, uh, time period, we can, I can't really cover all that stuff, but you know, entertainment, going back to entertainment and, and Beth's real vision for what, what the future is, it's really all about you, right? If you look at the sort of three sort of circles of entertainment as content, community, commerce. So you have, uh, and also the lines are blurring. Like if you look at Facebook, you have the community, you obviously have interest in content coming from the community, and community content also creates an environment and a platform to do commerce. And Yelp and Pinterest and, and Code Academy, I love Code Academy. If I had 26 hours a day, I would probably be like geeking out on Code Academy. But a lot of interesting stuff, and really what you don't have is you know, more than 24 hours. And all these community content and commerce define you and define your interests and really creates a virtual surrounding around you. And, and this obviously changes person to person. Right? I'm not gonna, I didn't put games here because games are everywhere. It's an incredible you know, entertainment content. So, so in terms of the you know, future of gaming, we, we look at this all the time because our goal is to, really, uh, to make sure that you have an incredible and, and very gratifying user experience. You come back to us over and over again. Right? Any given month, 70% of our users are returning users. So that's really humbling and, and also raises the bar quite high for us to make sure that our experience is extremely interesting and because there are 
literally, you know, thousands of, right now about one million in apps out there. You want to make sure that we are one of the few that you come back to. But in the future, as we collect a lot of data about you, we don't know who you are, we don't know if it's Beth or John or Charlie, but we know a little bit about, you know, your behaviors. We're not like NSA, and we're only collecting some relevant game behaviors to make sure that we understand your preferences and then we sort of adapt to that by giving you relevant game experience. Experience. So in the future, you'll have a very personalized game experience. You, can, you and I can play the same game, and it will change. If I play the game maybe after three months, it'll adapt to me. So we're looking at some adaptive algorithms that really will understand you, and then change your progression model, or maybe some of the mechanics and, and the venues that are boosting, whatever you have available, virtual currencies, and the, the, whole, the whole progression could really be catered to you based on your acceleration through different nodes, and levels and how you battle and all that kind of stuff. So it'll be very personalized. It'll be extremely immersive. We're talking about augmented reality, virtual reality. And, and also it'll be ubiquitous. It'll be everywhere. It's part of your lifestyle. And you can, obviously you do it already, but this is, we're talking about much richer game experience. And it's just a part of your uh, in existence. And it'll have incredibly amazing graphics, right? If you look at even the in a current Xbox and PS4s, and imagine three to five years from now, the compute power, the, 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 the growth and, and the acceleration of the whole graphics and, and everything else, you'll have, uh, you'll have very amazing uh, gra graphics to surround you when you play the game. So, so again, I don't really have a lot of time to talk about different, you know, all different permutations, but, you know, when you look at your lifestyle, you're always talking about your, you know, tablet, your, your laptop or your phablet or your you know, smart TVs and so forth. Smart TVs are, by the way, they are here now, right? This is probably the first year that you'll see more of them as a mainstream lifestyle device. There have been a lot of experimentations and, and we've been talking to some of them. They have not app stores. You can be on your TV if you want to, somebody, and I much prefer to watch Game of Thrones, but you know, you can play games and, and, and have a collective experience with your family or friends. And you can have devices, uh, again, a part of your augmented or virtual reality experience. It really spans a different, you know, a lot of age groups. So from kid to mom and, and really from casual to hardcore games. In terms of the art uh, uh, genre and, and really looking at this, you know, smartphones and tablets, you know, one of the inter interesting things that are happening is that the form factor is becoming very flexible. So you can really do a lot of interesting things. In, Maybe in your car, maybe not in your car, on your chair, or whatever you do. It'll be a device that you can just literally hold through your pocket and open up and have an you know, experience and then maybe have part of it is having some sort of holograms and 3D experience on top of it. So that's technology is here. Probably takes a while in terms of implementation. We'll look at about, again, two to four year cycle. Or on your tablets, you can have... Uh, again, a 3D experience that as part of augmented reality that some a game or sort of emerging from the tablet or as you're driving around or walking and looking at the cityscape and have, this is really the Falcon Runner effect from the Star Trek, Star Wars rather, and you can have a you know, sort of immersive battle scene as you're walking and looking at the cityscape. And again, these technologies are currently here, but what we're talking about how rich and amazing they'll be in, in the next few years. Another part is, we talked about AR and VR. I'm sure you all know about augmented, which really combines the physical with the digital, and virtual, which is virtual. And, and from Halo to you know, Oculus VR. Right now, you can have Oculus VRs are going to get even better, but you can have a very satisfying experience right now. You know, just have the, the goggles and go around and, and really Display a civilization or save people or whatever you want to fly around. But it's only getting, going to get better because this is really the first wave of new innovations. And Beth asked about evolution versus revolution. I think we'll have a combination of both. Um, I'm almost done. Again, casual gaming, AR, VR, you can be at a park sitting on a bench and, and looking at around and then start you know, playing the Mario Kart game. Right? Again, this is currently available. Not necessarily a mass adopted, but it's going to be even more ubiquitous. Or you can be looking at your desk and just have a very cool tank battle right there. <laughs> and, and then we talked about virtual reality. I mean, you can have an active and passive virtual reality game experience. 
passive, just in observing the incredibly, you know, uh, uh, sort of creepy environment with all the colors and everything around you, like holodeck, or or you can just be a part of it. In this case, you're looking at a VR platform that you stand there, and then you have this 3D, uh, you know, graphics and, and environment that really captivates you. And again, something like this, it's much much better than what we're doing on small form, form factors right now. I want to close it with these two images. Uh, top is, again, part of our smartphone tablet you know, evolution that you can obviously imagine a kid playing in the back seat and with it, his uh, you know, iPad or, or Nexus and playing a 3D game or learning about something uh, about the environment, but fundamentally being very entertained and engaged. As you know, right now one of the most popular babysitters are iPads. Right? You see families going to restaurants and they have an iPad for the kid and he or she is quiet for two hours and, they, and, and then they have a quiet time for themselves. But that is again the beginning of what's going to happen. The bottom part, I'm a soccer fan, so this was a great idea by Japan. They bid for 2022 World Cup. And one of their proposals, by the way, they didn't win it, which I'm really upset about, but the Japan's proposal was this 3D holographic game experience that they would broadcast. So if we're here, we're not in Tokyo, there's a game going on, say US is playing Brazil, we could go to Stanford or Berkeley soccer field and watch the game as it is being played. I thought this was a phenomenally exciting idea, that I would love to go to any stadium and watch the game that's being played. It's a much, much, much different game experience than you know, watching um, on your uh, TV set. So that's where we're going, and hopefully I was able to sort of give you some pieces about which direction the future might hold and, and take us to. <coughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, one of the things I really love about Marco's company is their mission is they're dedicated to being, uh, you know, geared towards family play. Uh, they don't list themselves as a game company, but more a, uh, a fun company, right, dedicated to fun. Is there a burning question for, uh, for Marco here before we move on to Sophia? Okay, we'll hold those questions there. So, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Great presentation. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like to introduce our, our last presenter, and then we're, we're going to actually bring all of our presenters up tonight and have a little bit of interactive give and take. I know I have questions for them because I'm, I think about the future of, uh, of entertainment and play all the time. Uh, so we're going to have the three of them up here, so think about what you might want to ask and where we, where we want to take the conversation to go. Uh, in the interim, though, our final presenter is Sophia Kim. Uh, Sophia has been involved in in entertainment and media for, for a couple of uh, decades. She started when she was this big. Uh, and, uh, and, and, yes, there we go, thank you. And now is the CEO of a new company uh, called Teledami, and I'll let her tell you a little bit about okay. that. So thank you, so much. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. So um, Marco and Charlie did such a fun job talking about games, both physical and going into virtual as well as casual gaming. I'm taking a different spin on entertainment. Um, I'm actually on the board of the Producers Guild New Media Council, so another plug for all of you producers out there who are not yet members. It's a wonderful organization. And some of the debate that we have within our organization and at the broader kind of entertainment industry level is thinking about what entertainment is and what it's going to be. So I'm going to start out with a few thoughts for entertainment in 2014. Oops, we're going right here. Okay. Redefining entertainment, the no off button, people call it always on, but I think there's a difference in physically thinking about the fact that there is no off button, and the power of participation. So let's just jump right into redefining entertainment. 
I'm looking at a really diverse and interesting crowd. I met a lot of you and, and know a lot of you from the industry. So I'm going to start out with this question for all of you. How many of you consider yourselves entertainers? Okay, we have a little bit more than the 1.3% that Mark had. Um, and you don't have to be professional entertainers, you certainly don't have to be a good entertainer. But we have about less than 5% here. Oh, we've got 5.5%, great, okay. Uh, but not a lot of you would consider yourselves entertainers. I'm going to actually borrow a dictionary definition from Oxford. And the way they define entertainment, which is a very broad definition, is the action of providing or being provided with amusement or enjoyment. So it doesn't say anything about professionally creating something. It doesn't say anything about being paid to be an entertainer or be part of entertainment. It's a very broad definition. And entertainment is a lot about storytelling. And so I'm going to start out with a story. It's about seven young adults between 18 and 25 who were paid approximately $2,500 at the time to lock themselves and be videotaped and agree to be videotaped for 24 hours a day for a period of about three months in a Soho loft. Does this sound familiar to anybody? This is MTV's The Real World. And this was the year 1992. It's probably one of the longest running reality TV shows. Um, it's going into its next season in San Francisco, ironically. And Real World was about real people. It was pre-recorded. It was curated by professional producers. And it was kind of turned what modern day reality TV is in 22 minutes, of course, 30 minutes with commercials. Now we're going to fast forward to 2014. And all of us, beyond the reality shows that are out there already, know real people who live and share their lives instantly. In fact, I know a lot of you are doing that right now with your phones on uh, and tablets and phablets and other devices. It's user-generated content that's self-curated. And it's really modern day real life always on 24-7. And that really is any social network or social media that you participate in. So if you belong to Twitter, Snapchat, you can name any of the social media networks out there. I would throw in something like WordPress in terms of blogging, there's Blogger, any of those. If I repose the question then to you and say, are you entertainers, how many would you actually would raise their hand and say they're entertainers? Pretty much the entire audience. And you may not actually consider yourself an entertainer, but when you have a fan base and you have users following you on any of these networks, you are actually creating entertainment. The no off button is an interesting phenomenon. So mobile has fundamentally changed the way we have access to content. Mobile has given us access not only 24 seven, but to things that we would not even have actual contact with. So let me give you a couple of stats, and these are probably not new to a lot of you in the mobile industry. There's an estimated 1.75 billion global smartphone users that are expected in 2014, and there's a total of about 4.5 billion mobile users. Approximately you know, 2 billion, more than 2 billion worldwide, 49% of the mobile phone users will go online at least once a month. <coughs> And this is, I think we're a little bit in a microcosm here, especially in the Bay Area. But if you think about this globally, that's quite a significant phenomenon effect. And in 2014, mobile devices will become the primary computing devices for most end users. And that's a fundamental change that we've seen from the last couple of years. So with this in mind, mobile now all gives us access. And apps gives us creation power. So this is just an example of Telegami, where it's a mobile app that lets you create and share a quick animated video, and we call those Agami. And you can create and share a video in seconds, and enables anybody. You don't have to be a 3D animator. Uh, you don't have to be a professional content producer to, within seconds, produce an animated video. And now multiply that with the number of apps in just the App Store alone. So these are recent statistics. There are over a million apps in the App Store. And I just took a generalization of some of the categories that I would define as entertainment, because a lot of the apps kind of 
go in between these categories. So if you think about games, and Marco gave a great stat about the number of gaming apps that go on to the App Store. Uh, entertainment in general, we put telegami in the entertainment category. I would argue that books are considered entertainment, music, sports, photography. A lot of the photo apps actually fall into photography. And then social networking in general. And this makes up over 40% of the apps that are currently in the App Store. So if you think about it that way, over 40% of apps are entertainment or entertainment based, which is a significant portion of the App Store. So let me just give you an idea of a couple of stats from Nielsen. According to Nielsen's cross-platform report, Nielsen says that 85% of mobile owners use their tablet or smartphone while watching TV at least once per month, and 40% daily. They're online taking a deeper dive into programming, checking sports scores while watching games, on social networks, and the majority of tablet owners use apps while watching TV. In fact, I created this video with the Telegami app during a commercial. Mobile apps make it easy for anyone to create, share, and participate in entertainment. So this is created truly while I was watching a commercial, um, in 30 seconds or less, and I think all of us would attest to the fact that we're always on. If you think about this concept of multi-screen, I would argue that it's the no-off button because across your multiple devices, someone is always on, someone is always creating. In fact, a, a recent stat from the Telegami stats, um, there's someone creating uh, a video using Telegami every few seconds worldwide. Now multiply that by the number of entertainment apps out there, and there's always constant creation. And the last question is really about the power of participation. This is not new as a concept, but this is the year that I think it will actually be very prevalent and the lines will become very blurred with traditional media. When, how many of you watched American Idol? Or did watch it at some point? Everyone's watched it at some point, I would have to say. Uh, when they first did their voting with text, it was a huge, integration between traditional media and with technology. Uh, Google actually just announced today that they're participating so you can actually vote by searching. So there's now five different ways that you can vote, including the traditional phone line if you, any of you still have landlines. Now fast forward, and we've got 2014, and fans want to engage, they want to interact, they want to connect, they want to play games, they want to not only connect with the content, but other viewers and users of that product and actually engage together. This is just an excerpt that I took from The Walking Dead. They've done a really interesting job with their fan base. They have over 23 million fans on Facebook and growing, uh, 2 million on Twitter. And what's interesting about uh, The Walking Dead is that the company and the production actually encourages fan-based sites. So AMC has their own site that they run and they run it very effectively. I actually did a screen grab uh, last night and it was really interesting because it was like every couple of seconds people were talking about and arguing and I couldn't figure out where to take the snapshot because it was so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but they also support and, and really encourage the fan bases to go out there and create their own forums and create their own fan sites and create their own blogs. And it's the continuation of always having the conversation and the story continue. So this idea of power of participation, users want to, viewers want to participate, and the mechanisms, the, ac the access, the always on, actually gives us opportunity to do that. Another example, uh, which is interesting and new, and they're just launching it this week, is Hawaii Five O on CBS. Uh, they actually have taken it to an extreme level where you can actually vote on the scene, the weapon, the victim, the outfits, the music, the title of the episode. And that's actually going on right now. I think they're on their second phase. As you can see from the screen grab, um, the murder weapon will be a high heeled shoe. <laughs> um, so that should be an interesting storyline. But again, a unique case where traditional media says we want input from our fans, so much so that we're going to actually think about rethinking how we do production to incorporate that feedback real time 
and to make sure that that gets inputted. Um, this is a, a great example. There's several others out there. But one of the things interesting to note is everyone is taking note about how their viewers, the users of the product, want to actually engage and figuring out new ways of engagement. So when I think about 2014, I would say the key takeaways would be we're redefining entertainment. So we're all entertainers. There's no off button. So because we have easy access, it enables constant creation and constant engagement. And we have power participation. So fan input and interaction is now going to be a normal part of our entertainment experience. It isn't just a time slot. It's a continuous conversation. It's continuing that story. Oh, there we go. That was my view. <laughs> Thank you. My understanding is they're taking the data from the users and then actually incorporating it into the show. So you'll see one fan-based episode in its entire case. Um, what they did recently, however, was they actually voted on the ending on the East Coast and the West Coast. So they actually let the users decide on the ending for that particular episode. But this fan-based episode is completely created by the fan and will air together. You know, it's a, it's a fabulous phenomenon that we're starting to see. And, you know, when we, we started gathering quotes for the future of entertainment. And uh, our Melissa uh, Lamming, if, if she's here, Melissa, are you here? Uh, was talking about that the future of entertainment is going back to an old Hollywood studio era where there are literally hundreds of people uh, involved in the production of any one of these things. But the, a big difference now is that the audience is part of your team. And you always have to consider them part of the team. It's not, you know, we're talking to you, we're talking with you. And it's a two-way conversation. So I think that it's a, it's a great point that we're talking about. So we've got a, a number of uh, really different perspectives here. I'm going to actually start to hand the uh, uh, microphone on. So I'm, I'm, I'm loud, Beth. You don't need to. All me. right, Whitney, you go. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about Teledami. Sure. How do you share those... Um, I don't know what you're calling them, but the... We call the video Tadami. So Tadami is uh, a video that you create that's specifically designed for smartphones and for mobile devices. So we use 3D gaming technology, so it's very touch-based. Um, but then you can actually share it with one, t one tap. You can share it on any social network. You can share it as a text or an email. And it comes as a link so that the end user or the viewer does not have to have the app. Okay. And as long as they have internet connectivity, they can actually view the video. John. Um, so I made notes here, so I'm going to read them. Um, I want to know how, uh, generally, how you cut through the sponsors' fears, because um, the business model remains the same for each of the three of you. Your it's a sponsorship model, because if nobody's paying, then somebody's paying, um, and. Why do you suppose the sponsors are so far behind where we're all claiming the audience actually is? And how do you cut through that fear? All right, that's, that's a good question. Because, you know, where goes entertainment, so goes advertising, eventually. I, th I think it's the reverse. I think the sponsor is still calling the shots because it's money. So. I actually would disagree. I think the audience is calling the shots, but but I think that you're right. I think that there's there's a lot of issues around money, right? And how do we make money with free to play games? Uh, I think you have to, and you start with a great game. But uh, that's really a cliche because nobody really says I'm going to develop a shitty game, right? I mean, you really start with the premise that I'm going to come up with a great game. Unfortunately, your you know vision versus reality uh, is somewhat uh, sometimes dislocated. But um, really, again, the challenge right now is I talk to indie developers uh, daily. They have great games, but they don't get the visibility because you know user acquisition is extremely important and expensive. And I know we're not talking about sponsors, so I'm going to digress based on your question. And and you really have to find a partner, maybe find a sponsor to really promote your game, right? Because there's really no easy way for an indie developer to go out there and get the visibility. 
And if you really want to charge your games on iOS and Google Play, you have to spend minimum 57.5k easily as a starting point, and you can you know, triple that easily to get up the top 20, right? We don't do that. We, we use our network and we sort of do our cross promotion. And, and in terms of making money, is really, uh, again, a lot of challenges. A uh, big part of the challenge for any developer is the live ops. Because mobile game is when you do beta, you really, your journey starts. And following ideally 24 plus months, you will optimize the game, look at the user funnel, how the, you know, the currency and the economy is, is behaving, and drop-offs and, and progressions and everything else, you fine-tune it. If you look at the launch of Candy Crush or Clash of Clans, you will see that the first six months, they had very little volume, but they were tweaking, fine-tuning, fine-tuning, and they hit the point, KPIs, and they went you know, full force. So a real combination of a number of things, and uh, uh, but you obviously start with a great team, great game idea, and, and really get some sort of sponsor, I guess, in that context to help you in the marketing fund. So um, I have a couple of comments. So first of all, Telegami isn't sponsor-based. We're in-app purchase, so it's a slightly different model. But I can speak to the general video market that we're seeing, and in YouTube is a good indication of this because they've been around for quite a while. I think the difference going forward will be there's always a sponsor for the right target audience. So if you think about a million videos, there will be a sponsor for that niche, niche, niche knitting video um, you know, out there on YouTube. Uh, and it's matching those sponsors and targeting those sponsors with the right content. And that's why a lot of these companies that actually are advertising based are focusing so heavily on targeted advertising. The more we know about the person, the more we know about the content, then you can correctly match it. And that's actually where I think the, the industry in, in terms of monetization is moving. Charlie, did you want to weigh in? I think that there's a bit of a, an innovator's dilemma that happens in the, uh, uh, in, in the toy space. And, and while I know you're talking about direct kind of advertising sponsors, I think that you know, Charlie's business is also kind of appealing to the Mattels and the Hasbros of the world that are also a bit trepidatious to go into this brave new digital world. Yeah, the apps we've worked on don't have commercials, so don't have ads. Um, so I really don't have a lot of expertise or experience to talk about that. And furthermore, in the space that we work in, which is kids that are really younger than eight, there's COPA, which is uh, prohibitive in terms of, of what you can and can't do. You can't collect data. You have to be very, very cautious about uh, gathering any sort of information. Um, so really, the business model that I think is working still is merchandise. You buy the toy and hopefully uh, that's where you make money and uh, those are advertised on TV shows. And if nothing else, the app either creates a new reason to care about the toy or to create brand awareness. That's a very simple view of, of where we're focused on. Uh, but our business primarily focuses on content development and on product development rather than on the, you know, we're not, a, I don't have, other than the fact that we put out a few apps of our own, we're not actually a toy company, we don't sell directly to consumers or interface that much, that often do them. We're serving those companies that you mentioned. I, you know, I, I think the question about business models is a really interesting one, right? You know, when I was talking, I mentioned that business models are changing and that the traditional models are actually going down, right? And we're seeing this again and again. Sorry, having a little bit of problem with my mic. Um, I'll just talk about it. Uh, that the traditional models are actually suffering, right? We're seeing Mattel, Hasbro from the toys space. We're seeing the traditional networks trying to shift and, and, and pivot. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, broadcasters and filmmakers and, you know, Ridley Scott came out with Prometheus as a transmedia app because he felt that he needed to have the digital presence to move the traditional sales. And this is happening across the board. So I think that in the next you know, coming years, we'll see new models emerge. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to see is increasing hardware sales. The number of hardware and wearable companies that the Bay Area is producing these days are, are growing exponentially because people know how to pay for hardware, they know how to pay for toys. 
um, what the business that Marco is dealing with, people are expecting everything to be free, right? You know, the App Store with its million apps has pushed from, you know, $69.95 for downloadable content for a game down to near zero, right? And so we've got to be very creative with how we're reinventing these business models and turning on these free-to-play in-app in purchase models. Uh, that, you know, it, it, it's really taking a little bit of wizardry uh, to make this work. Uh, I actually want to ask uh, our, our panel uh, a more general question about content. Because one of the things that I'm seeing is a bit of a conundrum. You know, we're seeing on the one hand this move towards very <coughs> high-end, 3D, you know, uh, almost realistic graphics um, that are, you know, booming and selling really well. And then we're seeing Minecraft which is very pixelated. And then we've got all this user-generated content, which is, again, a bit lower quality. So we've got this big chasm in the quality of entertainment that's out there. And, you know, and so Minecraft is a billion-dollar property. Mojang has 32 people in their company, and they're putting this out. Uh, so there is money to be made in, in that. So I, I, I want to ask each of you what you think about the chasm in quality of entertainment that we're getting. Sure, I'll start. Um, you know, we, we grapple with this every day as a team because we actually created an app in 3D. And a lot of companies out there do animation in 2D. And what we wanted to do was make the creation process as fun as the output. And so when you actually play in 3D, you can size the character, you can move the character around, you can spin the character around. So our engagement numbers are very high on the creation process as well as the, uh, as the viewers. And that's something that we think about as an uh, enabler of storytelling, right? It's always about the story, it's about the creation process, and we want to make our products something that's fun and engaging to create with, as well as to view at, at, at kind of the tail end. So that's something that we consciously always think about. I would say in storytelling and entertainment in general, you have to have a good product or story. It has to be fun and engaging. It can be the most complex product in the world, but if it's not simple enough to actually play with, especially with an app that does not come with instructions, from the time you turn it on and instantly engage, doesn't matter how incredible the graphics or the technology is, you won't have users playing the game. Charlie? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's a chasm in quality, right, right between okay. user-generated content and things so, like Minecraft. Um, and World of Warcraft and Call of Duty 5. Well, I mean, the example I gave earlier of Wii, which sort of took a turn from, you know, platforms having more and more power, and Minecraft itself is an example. And I certainly don't know the answer to that question, but there's so many examples of people defying conventional wisdom and breaking the rules about what everybody expects to be the next achievement level. Um, you know, I started off as a musician, and it, there was everybody in the world wanted to figure out how to make a hit record, and it usually hit records came from left field. Um, you, know, you, you know, okay, everybody wants disco, so everybody produced disco, and then that was sort of dead, and then it was grunge. So I think the same applies to any form of entertainment. You know, why was SpongeBob great while another third of the shows flopped? You know, it didn't have higher production values. Um, why was Dora great and another 30 shows flopped not because of production value? So I think there are <coughs> irreducible things that are very hard to define that, that sort of define hits. I mean, in the, in the record business, picking a hit was like, you know, who knew how you could do it? There was no formula, and I think the same is going to be true in any form of entertainment. Um, so the sort of pursuit for higher resolution, I mean, higher graphics or any form of technological advancement empowers people. But the people who actually really make a difference use that power. You know, the Beatles were great because they got four track. Four track was great because the Beatles used it. Um, and, uh, and the same goes on down the road. You know, somebody comes along and knows how to use digital or knows how to use interactive or knows how to make it. Great iPhone app. I mean, Angry Birds isn't high resolution or high graphics or high investment. It just was the right thing at the right time. So I don't think you'll ever escape that or be able to predict it. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah I, I think in terms of Minecraft, low pixel count doesn't mean low quality game experience, right? 
And I think what they've done is a phenomenally empowering game experience, very engaging. You really have a limitless uh, 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 way to grow whatever you want to grow. And, and I, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if you look at a game, you really want to have an engaging game mechanics. Because a lot of time we talk about game ideas and, and I think it, 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 part of the graphic has to do with the genre too. When you're having, uh, you know, uh, MMOs, you really want to have a very realistic experience because you're in a battle scene and you may not want to see pixel. But in terms of Minecraft, I thought what they did was extremely clever, very empowering, and, and, and really sort of gives you unbounded way to create any environment you want to create. And also they came up with a very interesting business model. It's not a premium, right? So you can you know, make an investment and then you can run your own server, build whatever you want to build. You should see some of the online cities and, and really civilizations people are building. Uh, you know, I know people, they were nonstop on Minecraft for literally six months, day and night. And, and a good way to lose weight because one of them lost 25 pounds or something just playing <laughs> Minecraft. But extremely engaging game mechanics, very gratifying. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree. Sorry. Um, okay, I agree completely, and you know, and, and Charlie actually mentioned this, that historical play patterns, and, and, and play patterns are really what drive uh, character story and play patterns, and, and Marco mentioned character and story as part of what they put into their components. Are there questions from the audience? Yeah. So, so what are each of you doing in terms of creating that human experience that adds the user experience? I mean, do you... Find an artist. You go out and you know go to the theater. Go do something where you see something live. Obviously, musicians, yes. But I mean, it seems to me that what's more possibly missing in the future is this too much engineering mentality and less actual organic creation. And and some companies seem to silo themselves away from something that's a little too maybe touchy feely or creative, all creative and less you know design. You know. Like, that there's a control element of that. I mean, do you guys go out and, and I mean, do you survey people to, to create that good experience, to reach a human component? Do you uh, hire actors to act something out? Or, or I mean, what, what do you do to try and make it more personal? So, uh, th this is a good question. I'm going to actually try and distill it down, because he, you've made a couple of points, and I think that you've asked a couple of questions, right? You're asking about the creative process, for these three folks who are CEOs of entertainment companies. And the second thing that, that the gentleman is asking is how are you engaging your audience in that creative process? So let's break it down um, and, and start with the first question because we talked a lot about user-generated content and I mentioned the stat that you know like 68% of Hollywood producers are now seeing this as something that they need to consider to make money. And these people have to be considered part of the team. So how are you uh, engaging your audience to design your next products? Well, there's several components, right? If you look at the sort of production process, we start with ideation. So uh, ultimately, what you really want to build a franchise, right? Franchise plays make money, because otherwise you have to do one off, you know, stuff one, one after another. It's very expensive, highly risky. And you want to build a franchise, you want to have a brand name, obviously, you know, uh, uh, Lord of the Rings and all that kind of franchise plays are extremely important. And so what we, what we do is, honestly, we don't have the right answer. So we have a free forum of any given time we have about what we call top of the funnel 100 ideas. So everybody has an idea and then we sometimes bring outside you know, members or invite some of the fans to give us their ideas in terms of what kind of game they like to play. And our overall focus is the fun component because you can have a great idea and I tried to write a screenplay, I couldn't write more than five pages, but they say you have to write 10 pages. If you don't like the first 10 pages, then the rest is irrelevant, right? So you really want to make sure that idea translates to a very engaging and fun game mechanics. So once we like, we do, then you do prototyping, because idea to prototype part is really important. A prototype has to give you enough of an audience response that you can test it with the you know, focus groups. You can say they like it, but they not know they like it, they overwhelmingly like it, and they have great feedback. It really becomes a very iterative process. And, and after you do that, and, and you really go through the production to make sure that you have a sort of number of audience or users engaged with the game development, we bring them back, you know, groups of 5, 10, 15, we get feedback from them because you get really narrow-minded sometimes. You're in the trenches, you think you're on the right path, but they tell you exactly 
you know, uh, what they like, what they don't like. And, and then, not only that, when you do beta release, we go to Singapore or Malaysia or New Zealand or, or Switzerland, we test it with 20,000 people minimum, 20 to 30,000. Then you get another set of feedback, see how they like it, how they progress in the game. It really be, again, I'm just looking at it from mobile gaming. It really becomes an ongoing, continuous effort to hear the audience, react to their feedback, and then you know, to look at the data and, and use the data to come up with a very fun game experience. Um, well, that's a big question, but I think number one, what I do is try to hire really, really creative people um, and create a suitable uh, environment that empowers them and nurtures them. Um, and to have as a diverse, I mean, we're a small company, but have as diverse a staff as possible in terms of age, experience, skill set. So we have musicians, we have programmers, we have artists, we have game designers. We have project managers, um, and we try to get them all interacting. Um, I try to push a sort of a left-right brain connection. You know, if you're technical, I want you to understand the feeling we're trying to achieve. And if you're the artist, I want to educate you in the technology, because in our case, the technology is extremely limiting. We're working on 25 cent ICs powered by cell batteries. I have a little speaker and we have to make that fun. So that's the number one thing. Um, and I personally, you know, attend every toy fair I can to see what's happening. I listen to our customers who have big research departments. And uh, so, you know, it's a combination of, of just opening yourself up to stimuli. And I think part of it is mindset. You know, I ran a recording studio for several years before we found creativity. Um, and I had this realization that I was running a service bureau and that creating content, being creative basically, was creating much, much more value than being, no matter how good I was and how great our facility was. And I named our company Creativity and I was amazed that I got away with it. It's trademark, we're registered as a corporation. <laughs> to remind us every day why we're there, because we slip into a, what I would call a service bureau mentality. We're delivering on time, we're meeting the spec. But we're in Silicon Valley and you know we have a high overhead and we pay people, we try to pay people well, so I can't compete from a, that point of view. I can only compete because they are buying something intangible of unique value, like a song that actually moves you or a game that is actually fun or an idea that you care about. And that's really what we try to focus on doing. Um, I mean, and another way to answer your phrase your question is, how do you be creative? And that's a big question. And, and we just work as hard as we can to, to both be very professional and be creative, which sometimes creates a certain tension, but hopefully a, a positive tension. Great. So, so I have a slightly different perspective because what we do at Telegami is we actually enable other people to be creative and to become storytellers. So we're an enabler app. And uh, it goes back to the power of participation. I probably see a couple hundred emails a week from um, people who have actually played with our app. A lot of them amazingly amount, uh, we look at the data and it's like they spend a lot of time with our app and they send us feedback. And it's specific, bullet point by bullet point, of what they would like to see, why they would like to see it. And I often take the email and engage with them and say, that's really interesting. We wouldn't have thought of the app being used for that purpose. How are you using that? And then as a team, we start to categorize and funnel very much like Marco said. We take all of the feedback from ourselves, because we like to play with the app as well, as well as their users who are using the app. And then look at kind of forward thinking other things that the technology may enable us to do that we haven't even introduced yet. Like the idea of someone says, hey, I'd like a flying car. You don't know you need a flying car until you can actually drive a flying car. So it's a combination of all that. But at the end of the day, our model is really to keep it simple. Apps are very challenging because, again, as I mentioned, they don't come with instructions. You, you download an app, you turn it on, and you have about, I would say, a few seconds where you either engage or you don't. And if you lose that engagement, it's very hard to get that engagement back. 
And so our key idea when we design and add things, when we take a lot of things out, when we go through the process, is say, when we start engaging within the second, we can play with that app. And how do we continue that engagement? And we look at our engagement numbers as much as we look at how many people produce family videos. And that's important for us. Great, great. So any other questions from the audience? Yeah, over here. Uh, so are any of you involved in ed tech or um, have products uh, that are going to go into the education um, Edutainment, ed, ed, ed technology is a good question. I think it's going to be a big and growing area. <coughs> Not for us. No. We actually didn't intend to be in ed tech or in entertainment. And I would say that teachers are incredibly resourceful. And we have a large percentage of our user base who are teachers and students. Um, one of the things we've intentionally done is, for a couple of reasons as well, as mentioned before, is we don't require registration. And that's very specific to us because it allows more people in the education system to participate. So we don't force someone to have a specific account to use the app. Uh, and that's feedback that we've heard very strongly and that we'll probably continue to do or make it optional. And no age limit either. No age limit, right. Um, we have worked on a lot of products that claim to have learning benefits, but it's really learning light. It's preschool, it's leapfrog type products, although they're not currently a <coughs> customer. Um, and other things you'll find in the toy aisle. So there's really a dividing line between this is really curriculum-based or related and educational versus, you know, it's got phonics or ABC or some learning in it. We do a lot of the former, but we really don't do any of the latter. Um, uh, or very, very little of it. I think it's going to be a growing area, though. And, and, and it's an interesting time for that. As somebody who made edutainment titles on CD-ROM back in the day, you know, I think that we're going to see a, a lot of shifts and a lot of even toy and game companies are going to try and get that little edge back. Scholastic has just done this phenomenal job of staying in the front of mind and presence of both the, the teachers and parents. And that actually helps them to get over one of the biggest issues of games and toys, which is discoverability. Right? And having that kind of asymmetrical marketing, I think, is really helpful. And having somebody else's seal of approval is also really helpful when you're going after a kid's game market. Jan, you had a question. Um, I teach aspiring filmmakers at San Francisco State, and filmmakers used to think they were the future of entertainment. Um, so my question to everybody on the audience, I, the semester is starting, I see my students for the first time on Wednesday, what's the most important thing I should tell them um, in terms of the future? And if they are low-budget indie filmmakers, uh, how do they go about getting a deal to do an app or a toy to go with their movie? You they know should what? play our games all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying they don't play games, I'm saying they see it as a distinct other thing. They don't see it as part of their building. You know, it's a phenomenal question, and just for if, if, if not everybody heard it, Jan is a professor at San Francisco State University in the cinema department, and she's asking our esteemed panel, what do you tell aspiring filmmakers? What is their future of entertainment? What should they be making? What should they be aiming? For and you know how will they structure their careers, and that's a great question. Should they be aiming at a narrative film process? Should they all be looking to make interactive films or games or? Does anybody want? To? My perspective is very um, kind of producer skill centric, where it's really about the story. They should be creating and developing stories that they're passionate about, especially independence. It's a very hard field to be in. So what I would say is. Do what you love, but then this is a great time because there are apps out there. I mean, Telegon is just one of them. There are apps out there that you can use to continue the story in different ways. You don't have to create your own app to go with uh, a particular film. You can leverage the variety of apps that are out there. You can leverage the variety of distribution um, that is available, especially for independence, that was not available even a decade ago. Uh, and so think about YouTube and being able to actually create your own channel. And that was not a distribution mechanism that was available to other people. And being very creative about viral marketing, getting the word out. And again, I think it goes back to passion. If you're passionate about that project and finding other people who are passionate about that topic, you'll find an audience. Great. I have a 
Yeah. I had a comment on that. I, I think common problem element for us is the storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, like games, <coughs> obvious movie, movies are grand stories, and uh, uh, sometimes they focus too much on technology. And after Avatar, you had a bunch of 3D movies. In fact, they're all crappy, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, the story was the, the differentiating factor. All, you know, yes, the 3D flowers are beautiful, all that kind of stuff, but the story was in interesting and engaging. So we were all focused on. Uh, you know, coming up with a great and engaging story, I think, for movie you know, you know, producers, that's even more important. Because technology should be almost invisible to the experience, but enhancing it at the same time. Great. Charlie, did you want to weigh in on this one? Uh, well, I can't speak too much about filmmaking, but when people ask me for advice for students, I would say study computer science. <laughs> um, seriously, because I didn't. And, uh, and I, you know, I wish I had, I mean, uh, had punch cards. Um, and, and when I'm hiring young people, I pay attention to that, even if they're not in any way, you know, if they're an artist or a uh, uh, composer, I think mastery of technology these days, which is really about you know, computers or, or computer science or programming is an essential piece is something I would recommend they put some effort in. It's kind of like my parents say, you want to take guitar? Well, maybe you should take some accounting courses. <laughs> Not quite the same, but. You know, it, it, it's a great question, and I know that there are other questions from the audience. Uh, you know, and we're, we're actually going to have to wrap this soon, so the, uh, the, the panelists will be here with us. Uh, I, I just want to kind of wrap, because I thought that this was a great question, you know, and kind of wrap on this one. Um, and, and basically, I, I think that, you know, with our, with our young audiences, it, it does go back to the fundamentals. Uh, we talked about this with play patterns. Uh, we talked about story and character. We talked about empowering an audience. And I think that the fundamentals are always the most important part. If you've got a great story, you'll be able to get it out there. Um, look at things in phenomenos like annoying orange that can just catapult out of nowhere. Uh, and really find an audience and, and you know, and, and create something that, that just moves the world. Or even J.K. Rowling's um, Harry Potter, right? A, a woman on the dole, you know, sitting with her newborn baby writing a book in a cafe, was able to kind of move the world with these characters and story that she created. Um, so, you know, I, I want to, I know that there are other questions. Our, our panelists are going to be here. There's more beer and wine, uh, so I hope that you'll enjoy us. Uh, we've got our, our demo stations that are still here. Join me in thanking our panelists for their great uh, <laughs> And we'll look forward to seeing you at our next event around GBC. Thank you all. The fact that there is no off button. And the power of participation. So let's just jump right into redefining entertainment. I'm looking at a really diverse and interesting crowd. I met a lot of you and, and know a lot of you from the industry. So I'm going to start out with this question for all of you. How many of you consider yourselves entertainers? Okay, we have a little bit more than the 1.3% that Mark has. Um, and you don't have to be professional entertainers. You certainly don't have to be a good entertainer. But we have about less than 5% here. Oh, we've got 5.5%. Right, okay. Uh, but not a lot of you would consider yourselves entertainers. I'm going to actually borrow a dictionary definition from Oxford. And the way they define entertainment, which is a very broad definition, is the action of providing or being provided with amusement or enjoyment. So it doesn't say anything about professionally creating something. It doesn't say anything about being paid to be an entertainer or be part of entertainment. It's a very broad definition. And entertainment is a lot about storytelling. And so I'm going to start out with a story. It's about seven young adults between 18 and 25 who were paid approximately $2,500 at the time to lock themselves and be videotaped and agree to be videotaped for 24 hours a day for a period of about three months in a Soho loft. Does this sound familiar to anybody? This is MTV's The Real World. And this was the year 1992. It's probably one of the longest running reality TV shows. Um, it's going into its next season in San Francisco, ironically. And Real World was about real people 
It was pre-recorded. It was curated by professional producers. And it was kind of termed what modern day reality TV is in 22 minutes, of course, 30 minutes with commercials. Now we're going to fast forward to 2014. And all of us, beyond the reality shows that are out there already, know real people who live and share their lives instantly. In fact, I know a lot of you are doing that right now with your phones on uh, and tablets and phablets and other devices. It's user-generated content that's self-curated. And it's really modern day real life, always on 24-7. And that really is any social network or social media that you participate in. So if you belong to Twitter, Snapchat, you can name any of the social media networks out there. I would throw in something like WordPress in terms of blogging, there's Blogger, any of those. If I repose the question then to you and say, are you entertainers, how many would you actually would raise their hand and say they're entertainers? Pretty much the entire audience. And you may not actually consider yourself entertainer, but when you have a fan base and you have users following you on any of these networks, you are actually creating entertainment. The no off button is an interesting phenomenon. So mobile has fundamentally changed the way we have access to content. Mobile has given us access not only 24-7, but to things that we would not even have actual contact with. So let me give you a couple of stats, and these are probably not new to a lot of you in the mobile industry. There's an estimated 1.75 billion global smartphone users that are expected in 2014, and there's a total of about 4.5 billion mobile users. Approximately you know, 2 billion, more than 2 billion worldwide, 49% of the mobile phone users will go online at least once a month. <coughs> And this is, I think we're a little bit in a microcosm here, especially in the Bay Area. But if you think about this globally, that's quite a significant phenomenon effect. And in 2014, mobile devices will become the primary computing devices for most end users. And that's a fundamental change that we've seen from the last couple of years. So with this in mind, mobile now all gives us access. And apps gives us creation power. So this is just an example, Telegami, where it's a mobile app that lets you create and share a quick animated video, and we call those Agami. And you can create and share a video in seconds, and enables anybody. You don't have to be a 3D animator. Uh, you don't have to be a professional content producer to, within seconds, produce an animated video. And now multiply that with the number of apps in just the App Store alone. So these are recent statistics. There are over a million apps in the App Store. And I just took a generalization of some of the categories that I would define as entertainment because a lot of the apps kind of go in between these categories. So if you think about games, and Marco gave a great stat about the number of gaming apps that go on to the App Store. Uh, entertainment in general, we put telegami in the entertainment category. I would argue that books are considered entertainment, music, sports, photography. A lot of the photo apps actually fall into photography, and then social networking in general. And this makes up over 40% of the apps that are currently in the App Store. So if you think about it that way, over 40% of apps are entertainment or entertainment-based, which is a significant portion of the App Store. So let me just give you an idea of a couple of stats from Nielsen. According to Nielsen's cross-platform report, Nielsen says that 85% of mobile owners use their tablet or smartphone while watching TV at least once per month, and 40% daily. They're online taking a deeper dive into programming, checking sports scores while watching games, on social networks, and the majority of tablet owners use apps while watching TV. In fact, I created this video with the Telegami app during a commercial. Mobile apps make it easy for anyone to create, share, and participate in entertainment. So this is created truly while I was watching a commercial um, in 30 seconds or less. And I think all of us would attest to the fact that we're always on. Did we get that? Okay. 
So inter entertainment creation, if you think about this concept of multi-screen, I would argue that it's the no-off button because across your multiple devices, someone is always on, someone is always creating. In fact, a, a recent stat from the Telegami stats, um, there's someone creating uh, a video using Telegami every few seconds worldwide. Now multiply that by the number of entertainment apps out there, and there's always constant creation. And the last question is really about the power of participation. This is not new as a concept, but this is the year that I think it will actually be very prevalent and the lines will become very blurred with traditional media. When, how many of you watched American Idol? Or did watch it at some point? Everyone's watched it at some point, I would have to say. Uh, when they first did their voting with text, it was a huge integration between traditional media and with technology. Uh, Google actually just announced today that they're participating so you can actually vote by searching. So there's now five different ways that you can vote, including the traditional phone line if you, any of you still have landlines. Now fast forward, and we've got 2014, and fans want to engage, they want to interact, they want to connect, they want to play games, they want to not only connect with the content, but other viewers and users of that product and actually engage together. This is just an excerpt that I took from The Walking Dead. They've done a really interesting job with their fan base. They have over 23 million fans on Facebook and growing, uh, 2 million on Twitter. And what's interesting about uh, The Walking Dead is that the company and the production actually encourages fan-based sites. So AMC has their own site that they run and they run it very effectively. I actually did a screen grab. Uh, last night, and it was really interesting because it was like every couple of seconds people were talking about and arguing, and I couldn't figure out where to take the snapshot because it was so interesting. Um, but they also support and, and really encourage the fan bases to go out there and create their own forums and create their own fan sites and create their own blogs. And it's the continuation of always having the conversation and the story continue. So this idea of power of participation, users want to, viewers want to participate, and the mechanisms, the, ac the access, the always on, actually gives us opportunity to do that. Another example, uh, which is interesting and new, and they are just launching it this week, is Hawaii Five O on CBS. Um, they actually have taken it to an extreme level where you can actually vote on the scene, the weapon, the victim, the outfits, the music, the title of the episode. And that's actually going on right now. I think they're on their second phase. As you can see from the screen grab, um, the murder weapon will be a high heeled shoe. <laughs> um, so that should be an interesting storyline. But again, a unique case where traditional media says we want input from our fans, so much so that we're going to actually think about rethinking how we do production to incorporate that feedback real time and to make sure that that gets inputted. Um, this is a, a great example. There's several others out there. But one of the things interesting to note is everyone is taking note about how their viewers, the users of the product, want to actually engage and figuring out new ways of engagement. So when I think about 2014, I would say the key takeaways would be we're redefining entertainment. So we're all entertainers. There's no off button. So because we have easy access, it enables constant creation and constant engagement. And we have power of participation. So fan input and interaction is now going to be a normal part of our entertainment experience. It isn't just a time slot. It's a continuous conversation. It's continuing that story. Oh, there we go. That was my view. <laughs> Thank you. My understanding is they're taking the data from the users and then actually incorporating it into the show. So you'll see one fan-based episode in its entire case. Um, what they did recently, however, was they actually voted on the ending on the East Coast and the West Coast. So they actually let the users decide on the ending for that particular episode. But this fan-based episode is completely created by the fan and will air together. 
you know, it's a, it's a fabulous phenomenon that we're starting to see. And, you know, when we, we started gathering quotes for the future of entertainment. And uh, our Melissa uh, Lamming, if she's here, Melissa, are you here? Uh, was talking about that the future of entertainment is going back to an old Hollywood studio era where there are literally hundreds of people uh, involved in the production of any one of these things. But the, a big difference now is that the audience is part of your team. And you always have to consider them part of the team. It's not, you know, we're talking to you, we're talking with you. And it's a two-way conversation. So I think that it's a, it's a great point that we're talking about. So we've got a, a number of uh, really different perspectives here. I'm going to actually start to hand the uh, uh, microphone on. So I'm, I'm loud, Beth. You don't need to. All right, me. Whitney, you got <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about Telegami. Sure. How do you share those, um, I don't know what you're calling them, but the... We call the videos Adami. So Telegami okay. is uh, a video that we create that's specifically designed for smartphones and for mobile devices. So we use 3D gaming technology, so it's very touch-based. Um, but then you can actually share it with one, t one tap. You can share it on any social network. You can share it as a text or an email. And it comes as a link. So that the end user or the viewer does not have to have the app. Okay. And as long as they have internet connectivity, they can actually view the video. Thank you. John. Um, so I made notes here. So I'm going to read from them. Um, I want to know how, uh, generally, how you cut through the sponsor's fears. Because um, the business model remains the same for each of the three of you. You're, it's a sponsorship model, because if nobody's paying, then somebody's paying. Um, and why do you suppose the sponsors are so far behind where we're all claiming the audience actually is? And how do you cut to that fear? All right, that's, that's a good question, because, you know, where goes entertainment, so goes advertising, eventually. I, th um, I think it's the reverse. I think the sponsor is still calling the shots, because it's money. So, I actually would disagree. I think the audience is calling the shots, but, but I think that you're right. I think that there's, there's a lot of issues around money, right? And how do we make money with free-to-play games? Uh, I think you have to, and you start with a great game, but uh, that's really a cliche because nobody really says, I'm going to develop a shitty game, right? And then you really start with the premise that I'm going to come up with a great game. Unfortunately, your you know, vision versus reality is somewhat, uh, sometimes dislocated. But um, really, again, the challenge right now is I talk to indie developers uh, daily. They have great games, but they don't get the visibility because you know, user acquisition is extremely important and expensive. I know, I know we're not talking about sponsors, so I'm going to digress based on your question. And, and you really have to find a partner, maybe find a sponsor to really promote your game. Right? Because there's really no easy way for an indie developer to go out there and get the visibility. And if you really want to charge your games on iOS and Google Play, you have to spend minimum 50-75k easily as a starting point. And you can you know, triple that easily to get up the top 20. Right? We don't do that. We, we use our network and we sort of do our cross promotion. And, and in terms of making money, is really, uh, again, a lot of challenges. A uh, big part of the challenge for any developer is the live ops. Because mobile game is when you do beta, you really, your journey starts. And following ideally 24 plus months, you really optimize the game, look at the user funnel. And Something happened here. I do the French. 